Um, good afternoon. Yeah, um, I'm going to be talking about petrological monitoring. It's going to be a bit of an advert, really, for petrological monitoring in the context of the La Palma 2021 eruption. So this work's been done with colleagues from Tenerife, the Involcan in ITER, also from Whitman College and Berkeley in the United States, and then Teesside, Leeds, Manchester and Exeter in the UK. First of all, I'll just give a brief introduction to the eruption, talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the NERC Urgency Project, um, outline the sampling technique, summarise the mineralogy and really focus in on this whole rock lava time series. That's what I really want to concentrate on and how that relates to other monitoring signals, the geophysical data, to develop a petrological model. It's a working hypothesis. Um, highlight some take home messages and then just outline the ongoing collaborations and future work that we've got going on. As many of you already know, the eruption um, of La Palma Cumbre Vieja started on the 19th of September 2021. This was after 50 years of quiescence on La Palma. And really, there was only a week of accelerating unrest, um, shallowing of the seismicity before the eruption started. So, very little um, warning of that. And then it went on for about three months. The resident population on the Canary Islands, 2 million and 85,000 of those were on La Palma. But of course, in addition to that, we've got the um, tourists, the, this pre-pandemic figures that visit the island. The eruption was pretty typical of a basaltic ocean island, low flux event. We had some localised stromboli and explosive activity, but the main effect and the products, as you'll have seen, were the lava flows. Um, covering wide areas, mainly of residential land. Tephra was also associated. I'm not going to talk specifically about the tephra, but the compositions in the tephra that we've analysed mirror exactly what we see in the lava, so we can relate those two quite directly. Number of buildings buried, number of residents displaced. I mean, this had huge socioeconomic impact and the total damage was estimated at almost a billion euros. So this is why you know it's of interest and it's relevant. The NERC Urgency Project um, was led by Katie Chamberlain and we worked with colleagues at Involcan and the Canary Islands. They were sampling, particularly Matt Pankhurst, and then the samples were sent to the University of Granada. They were sent to, for whole rock analysis, University of Exeter for ChemScan mineralogical characterization. And then there was this Lidlodeca, the Luoc Library, that was kept um, and is open access for people to look at. What we were trying to do, apart from just generally characterise the samples, particularly looking at the textures, looking at the mineralogy, and that's leading into work that's ongoing about the thermobarometry and modelling timescales with diffusion, thinking about ascent rates. And the idea, of course, is to feed all of this back into risk and hazard management within the, the context of the Canary Islands. So the lavas were sampled. Um, here we can see the extent of the flow field. The locations are very representative geographically and temporally. We've got the um, days since the eruption started. Generally sampled from incandescent or flowing lavas, then quenched immediately to attract those compositions. And most of the early sites that were sampled were then inundated by later flows. So this was really important to have this systematic daily sampling and we'll see what we can interpret from that in terms of the, the compositional changes through the eruption. They're pretty typical alkali basalts, um, macrocrysts of titanium-rich orgite, clinoproxene, fairly magnesium-rich olivine. And then in the early stages of the eruption, we have this strange chaocytic amphibole that's very clearly here on the bottom right, not in equilibrium. Also, in the early stages, we have these xenolithic 120-degree grain boundary little clusters. And then after about a week, we see that the mineralogy changes. We get more olivine in the system. We get the amphibole is no longer present. And that coincided with the point at which the lavas became very much less viscous. The flow rate started to really increase. So the, that was related to the mineralogy and the composition. So in terms of the whole rock time series, here we're looking at lava compositions. And I've just picked out a few of the elements. We've got magnesium and nickel in the top graph. We've got calcium and scandium in the bottom graph. And all the lavas are primitive, metaluminous and alkaline. They have parallel normalised rare earth patterns, which indicates to us that they came from the same mantle source. 
um, low degree melting of garnet spinel and rich mantle. And there's apparently silicate mineralogical controls on these changes that we see. And the variation on the horizontal axis, we've got days since the eruption started. We can divide this into three stages. So we've got stage one, which is days one, two, five or seven. That's that mineralogically complex period where we saw the amphibole, the, the other complexity. Then we've got stage two, which lasted for about two months when we see a variation in the compositions, um, trending towards more primitive, higher magnesium, high calcium, apparently related to deeper tapping. And then at the very end, and for me, that's, this is the most interesting part, is we've got this inflection about two weeks before the end of the eruption to less primitive compositions again. Okay, so we're going to move on and, and think about that, how, how that ties into things. So this is the summary of stage one, two, three, the mixed alkali basalt, more primitive, um, tapping and evacuating of the system. And then at the very end, we've got this increase apparently in the residual component, which gives us this less primitive composition coming through again, potentially related to compaction of the system as the deep melt supply is drained. We can relate this to other monitoring signals, such as the earthquake. Here we've got the frequency and depth. The vertical black line there marks the initiation of the eruption. So we've got this early period, a week or so, across the reservoir, over pressure. Then the first week, a fairly shallow seismicity, moving into deeper seismicity through time. Then there's two months of these sort of two focuses of, of the earthquake activity. And then at the very end, coincident with our stage three, where we saw that inflection in the whole rock lava data, we see a, a waning of the deep seismicity in the system. So how can we interpret this in terms of the magma plumbing system? Well, we've got shallow magma body activated initially. Then we've got this progressively deeper tapping of an already established compositionally stratified system. And that contributes to this range of compositions that we saw in that whole rock time series. And then finally, how we're currently interpreting this final stage is a collapse of the deep reservoir, liberating melt, more evolved melt from in the, the crystal mush. So visualizing this um, in a work in hypothesis petrological model, we've got the pre-eruption stage, we've got 1950 through to 2021, deep activity of seismicity. We've got the symbols here, the general magma reservoirs marked in pink, then the different compositions with different shades of grey, darker being more primitive. Earthquakes marked by this symbol, so their approximate frequency and distribution location is marked on the, the figure. Um, earthquake migration that we'll see in later figures with this yellow arrow. Magma movement in red, volatiles in blue, and then contraction with these fat orange symbols. And finally, we've got the, um, sorry, I should be using this, the clinoperoxine and olivine. Here, the minerals that are involved. OK, so seismic swarms in the decades preceding, 2017, 2018, 2021, overpressure of the magma body. And if we look at what might be going on in these melt lenses, here we've got the melt and we've got the component of olivine and clinoperoxine in those. Um, stage one, middle of September, we've got this increase in shallow level seismicity apparent hybridization, X solution and pressurization with the component of magma and volatiles coming from greater depth, opening a conduit to the surface. And initial thermobarometry work suggests that the clinoperoxine cores crystallized at about 17 kilometers, whereas the rims are to a shallow level 13 kilometers depth. And the amphibol only from this disequilibrium is tying in with the clinoperoxine cores at about 18 kilometers. Um, moving through into stage two here from October through to the end of November, we've got deeper seismicity, release of the magma from this previously stratified system, and that continued for about two months. And again, we've got reflected in the initial thermobarometry, clinoperoxine cores deeper now, 23 kilometres, and the rims at 17 kilometres depth. Looking at what might be going on here in these melt lenses, we can see that we've got the crystals, we've got the mush, and we're getting this magma extracted from the system, which is a mix of the, the crystals and the melt. 
And then finally, stage three, well, and ultimately stage three, we've got the collapse in late November through to mid-December. The evacuation of the reservoirs happened. We've got progressive collapse. We see that in the ground deformation data. When this stage three starts, things fall back down again, 15 centimeters or so. Compaction of these lenses, and that lets us extract the more evolved melt that's interstitial in the crystal mush. So looking at that, focusing in on these, we're now getting this material coming up as this is compacted. And finally, um, mid-December, 13th of December, the eruption stopped. Quiescence at the surface, the deep magma supply is apparently shut down and that causes the cessation of the activity. What are the take home messages from, from these results? Well, that we can see quite robust and consistent mineralogical and geochemical trends as the eruption developed, um, and they're related to the depth and the crystallinity of the, the reservoir, and those change through time. The eruption, as we've seen with the earthquake data, permits us to link between subdisciplines in terms of thinking about syn eruption forecasting. We've got the whole com rock compositions that are tying in with ground deformation and earthquake activity. And finally, the thing that you know, I really want to highlight and underline is that often conventional forecasting and monitoring with geophysical gas and, and seismicity focuses on when an eruption may start. But if we've got real time petrological compositional changes happening during the eruption, we can potentially, as we see in this stage three, get insights into when an eruption may end. I mean, that's got huge implications for um, the local populations in these in these regions in terms of and also risk and hazard management, of course. Um, ongoing collaborations, future work. We're going to be testing this initial model that we've got for the petrogenesis with mineral textures and compositions as part of the urgency team and also looking at the olivine diffusion to think about ascent rates. Um, viscosity work being done by LMU in Munich, led by Ulrich Huber. Disequilibrium mineralogy, a study of those amphiboles, the kerstitic amphiboles that I was, we were looking at before, led by Alan Butcher in Finland. And then Luca Kariki's group in Geneva is looking at machine learning thermobarometry. And these are just a selection of the broad range of studies that are currently being done with the Litoteca, this collection of time series, very well constrained samples that INVOL can collected throughout the eruption. Um, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? <laughs>